Hello my front end friends. I've been getting a lot of questions about how I go from just having a design in front of me, whether it's a Figma file or a JPEG or just whatever it is, a, a, a file that a designer created and how do I plan things out to make it happen in the code. So we're going to be doing that today by looking at this project right here, which is a front end mentor project that has enough complexity going on with it that I think it's going to make it interesting enough, but it shouldn't take too long to do either. And we're going to be doing this from start to finish, going through the entire process and really breaking down my thought process when it comes to getting everything organized and set up in the HTML. It's also going to be a fun exploration of custom properties and some things we can do there. We'll be looking at grid and flexbox and hopefully a few other fun things along the way as well. And I've timestamped everything down below. So if you want to skip to certain sections of it, just go to wherever you are looking for. And with that, let's jump into this. And the first thing we want to do is just look at the design and we have a mobile design and a desktop design. In general, when I start writing my HTML and sort of breaking down the layout, I am going to focus on the desktop design first because it is always the more complex one. But you always want to look at both just to make sure there's nothing weird happening with like a major reorganization of the content. But in this case, we're just going from stacked to then two columns, so nothing too fancy here. So for now, I'll leave the mobile design off. Now we want to start writing some HTML for this. And when I look at something like this, the first thing that I am looking at is, is there anything really tricky or not? And I don't really think there is, but there is the main thing I noticed is that this, we have one big background for this all, and then two sections inside of there, because we can see the sort of that, you know, this has the border radius on it. So we just want to make sure that the parent has the box shadow on it, but we need some border radiuses on this right here. Uh, we have some interesting things with the colors and everything, but the main thing is we have a layout like this and we have two columns. So we could either use Flexbox or Grid to do this. It really doesn't matter. First thing we need to do is go ahead and create something that would allow us to do two columns. So in the HTML, I am just gonna use Emmet and hit tab here to get a basic starter uh, like that. We can give that a title. Then I'm going to go with a main just because we have nothing else on the page. Even though I won't use the main for this component type thing we're doing, we'll use a div for that. And I'm going to come in with something just like this where we have the result summary, which will be my entire thing. That will either get the display flex or display grid to create the two columns. And then I have my results and I have my summary, one for each of the two columns or in the mobile, they will be stacked one on top of each other. Now we're going to focus first on the results. So we'll clear everything else out of the way. And before we do that though, we don't, even though we're going to be working on this section right now, we don't want to completely look at it in isolation because it does live in a larger site. And one thing with CSS is it's global. It, it, we have, we can take advantage of how CSS works. And one thing we'll notice is while these two things right here and right there, these are different colors. Just because they're different colors doesn't mean that they're completely different. They have the same font size by the looks of it and the same font weight and other things like that. So in that case, I'm gonna have the same class for both of them and I can rely on inheritance to get the colors set up properly for each side since the two sides are different from one another. The other thing to, that I'm looking at when I'm breaking this part down is this is sort of like the title of my entire component. This is my results. I have my results here, result 76, great. And then I have a summary of those results. But this is the big title for the entire thing from like a logical point of view. This is, I'm looking at all of my results and then we're breaking things down. And because we have nothing else on this page, if I did, I might want a different heading level, but it's going to have the main heading level, which will be an H1 in this case. So we can add an H1 in there, nothing too fancy. And I've given it a class of section title because I want it to match what we have over here. Again, we're going to rely on inheritance to set the colors and things like that. So we don't need any modifier classes on this. Next, we can look at this section over here, which is the score. And basically, I see this just as we have results. Then we get our score right there. So your results, 76 of 100, all in one paragraph. Could be in a div. Uh, but the important thing here is I want to span around the 76. This information would be something that could be dynamically brought in through a database or whatever. So by this being in a span, it does make it easier to select. We could put a data attribute on it or something like that. Uh, but for styling purposes as well, we could hook into that span instead of trying to come up with some sort of obscure uh, class name for that, like result score, actual score. I don't know. Don't have to worry about it. We can just use result score and we have a span that we can easily style inside of that. Next, we have this section here. So the great and then the paragraph that follows it. So we can just do a result rank and then have a regular paragraph right after that. 
and I think that should work out pretty well. I have put all of this in a div just because if we look at the spacing here, this space and this space look pretty big and then we have a small space here. So whenever we have things like that, I find it easiest to create spacing in elements like this uh, using gaps. It's just so convenient now instead of mucking around with margins. So I can have a large gap set on those. We'll look at setting that up in a second. And then this can all be grouped together and this one can have the smaller gap set on that. Because we will be using gap, I just tend to use grid for things like this. Now there are some side effects to grid. They're gonna work out really well when we get to this side. So every now and then you might be better off with another solution, but in this case, it should work really well. So I'm gonna add this class equals grid flow right here. And we're gonna hook into this grid flow a little bit later on, but that's gonna set things up well here. But when we also have this that I mentioned, we'd wanna set that up on as well. So I'm gonna come all the way back up here where we set those results. And we can also add the grid flow on that one as well. Because this grid flow is different though and we want larger spacing on it, we could either use a modifier class or what I've started doing a lot more, which is using an attribute selector. So in this case, I'm gonna use a data spacing of large, which is gonna modify my default spacing that I have on the grid flow. If you'd prefer to go with something else like a modifier class instead of a data attribute, that's a perfectly valid solution as well. Now we can move over to the summary, which will be this part right over here, and we'll focus on that next. The first thing we're gonna do is add an H2, again with our section title, like I mentioned earlier. Now I used an H1 in the other section and then an H2 here, and the reason I'm using an H2 is the summary sort of falls underneath results. Results is the big title, now we're creating like a secondary section under there that's gonna have the rest of this information. So it's sort of like creating a table of content this is the subsection to my results. Now once again we have sort of larger spacing here and here and then we have the smaller spacing in between them. So for this part right here we can set up a grid flow just like we did earlier so it's going to space everything out with the regular spacing. And then on the entire summary we can add a grid flow with the data spacing of large on there so I get larger spacing here and here just like we were doing on this side as well. Let's clear all of this off because we want to look sort of at each one of these individually a little bit more. And so for each one of these, we do have a few different things going on. We have sort of a little micro layout going on within here. And these are the types of situations where I see flex working really well rather than grid like I was using there. Uh, flex could work to do the spacing the way I'm going to use grid. It just takes an extra line of CSS. That's the main reason I went with grid there. Uh, for these though, we have these little guys where the icons might be slightly different sizes. And we also have these words, some of the words are longer and shorter than each other. So I see this as a flex container that then has two things in it. We have one on this side and then this one here, and then we can just separate the two of them and we can use Flexbox for that. And then even in here, I see these sort of as two columns within the area. Probably we wanna vertically center things as well. So when I see something like that, I sort of picture, okay, that could probably be Flexbox uh, as well. Do we need to group it that way? There's other ways that we could achieve the same thing, but I think the simplest way to do it is to have this as a div within the larger space. So for each one of those four, we're gonna create a summary item. Then each summary item will be made up of a flex group that will have our SVG right there, and then the H3, which will be our summary item title. So we can have our title that's there that will change colors for each one of them. And then we also have the paragraph that will be our score over here. Now, just like here, when I wrapped this in a span, because that way we could have a data attribute on it, make it easy to reference a JavaScript and change that number dynamically, we can do the same thing over here with each one of these individual scores. And that also gives us a nice easy way to style those as well. Now, in this case, with each within each one of these summary items, we do have an SVG. And there's a couple of different ways we could approach this. The Front End Mentor project did give us individual SVGs for each one that already have colors on them. This is my reaction one. I'm gonna copy the SVG from here and I'm gonna put it in as an inline SVG. There are other ways of dealing with inline SVGs, but we're gonna take it the simplest way possible where I'm just gonna drop the actual SVG in here. We're gonna turn off word wrap for a second and take a look at what's set up in here. There's nothing that we need to change except for one thing which is when we look here, there is a stroke, which is what's controlling the color. We could leave this here because it's just going to work anyway, but I think it's a fun little addition if we actually take this stroke off from here. And on the SVG, we can add a class, and I'm just gonna call this summary icon. So it looks like there's a lot when we're dealing with inline SVGs, it can be a little bit annoying. You can always collapse things away if you want, or of course just turn off word wrap so it doesn't look so bad. So we have our summary icon, and then our, uh, our title that's gonna be here. And again, I don't have a stroke or a fill set on the SVGs. We're gonna rely on our CSS to do that to make things a little bit more dynamic. 
So that's just one summary item here. If we were using something like React or Svelte or Vue, uh, we could of course make these into components rather than having it as regular HTML like this, but I'm just gonna copy and paste it four times and update the text, so I'll be back in just a second. So I've brought in all four of them. We now have the summary item four times, but as I alluded to, when I see colors like this, and let's clear everything off again, when I see colors like this that are sort of different for each one of these, the first thing my mind goes to is using custom properties. And then I want a really easy way to manipulate that. So we'd want either a modifier class, or in this case, I will use a data attribute once again to be able to control the colors on each one of these. So I'm putting a data item type for each one. So we have our summary item, and then the item type is accent one, accent two, accent three, and accent four right here, which will be what controls our colors. And once again, if you do prefer using uh, a modifier class rather than data attributes, that's completely fine. With all of that done, the last thing that we do need to include over here is also our button. And because I only have one style of button, I will just call it button. But if you had multiple versions, you'd probably want to use some sort of modifier to set things like the background color and other things on it. Now with that done, I'm going to go all the way up and over here, we're just going to make sure I have a link to my CSS. We can use Emmet for that, where I'm going to do link colon CSS and hit return. It defaults to using style.css, which just happens to be my file name. But if you have a different location or a different file name for your CSS file, just make sure that you do put the correct path right there. Now, a fun thing with this project is Frontend Mentor did give us a font file, and it happens to be a variable font. So that's in my assets, in my fonts folder. So I'm going to set up a font face for that. And this font face declaration is looking at my font family, which is the name that I decide to give it. The font display swap is for performance reasons. Because it's a variable font, we list a range of font weights. And in this case, this font goes from 100 to 900. So I'm just making them all available to me to use in the project. And then I'm just putting the path to my font right here and the format of it, which is a true type because it is a TTF font. If I was putting this in production, I would be looking at updating this to a WOFF2 font just to help with uh, the compression of the file to make it a little bit smaller. And if you'd like to know more about setting up variable fonts and converting it to a WOFF2 font file, uh, there's a card popping up or a link in the description. Now, the next thing I always do is set up my variables and the variables in this case are my custom properties. I have set up quite a lot of them, as you can see here, especially for something that is as small as this. But one of the reasons for that is I've listed all of the HSL values as individual values for the colors. And then I've referenced those back to set them up within an HSL so I don't have to write it out every time. The reason I've taken this extra step is because we have lots of areas, the box shadow, the background here, the text colors here, where we're going to be using one of our HSL values, but we need to play with the different opacity levels and having these available like this makes it much easier. But if you're using one of these colors and you don't need to modify the alpha value, you just need the solid color, then it's a lot easier just to have something where your color works and it, it just works and you don't have to worry about it. So here we have the color that I'm setting up and then down here I have the HSL function and in there I'm using the custom property just to map them together. We'll see as we go through this though that sometimes we'll be using this version and anytime we need transparency or alpha values we'll be going through and using these ones right here so it'll give you a better idea of how it works. The other things I have mapped in here other than colors is well I did set up a couple of gradients. We have the gradient here that will also be used in our button and we have the gradient that's right here as well so those were set up. So other than my colors I have set up uh, the gradient I guess those are colors as well, but uh, these are all just coming straight from the design. I've taken the gradient that we have set up here and the gradient that is right here, and I've put those as custom properties too, just so I don't have to start worrying about them later on. When I need to use them, I just put in the custom property name and it works. Uh, and I've also set up the accent colors right here, which are the colors we're using over here. Uh, I've set up the font family as a custom property because that's always easier to do. And I've mapped out some font sizes this is a static JPEG. I'm just taking a guess at this point at what those are. And if we ever have to modify them later on, we can. But I, uh, And one of the reasons here is we have a 2.5, a 5, a 7.5. It just gives me a nice range that I can work with when I'm guessing at what my font sizes will be. And those happen to be pretty common ones all the way up to 2. And this looked a lot bigger, so I went with a 5. The font weights, Front End Mentor told us those are the font weights being used, so those are the ones I went with. Now, just before we get into getting the actual CSS, a very simple reset for a small project like this. I'm just setting my box sizing to border box. I'm removing margins from everything since I'm going to be bringing the margins back in using my flow classes. I've also set font to inherit, which sets all the font sizes back to one rem, including the defaults, uh, and it sets all the font weights back. 
I like doing this. It just forces people to use classes to declare what the fonts are going to look like instead of using heading levels because people will often use a heading level in the wrong way because it's styled the way they want it to look. So this just sort of prevents that. It is a little bit heavy handed, but for something like this, I think it does work well. We don't actually have any images and I don't know if we need this on our SVGs, but this is a line that I just include basically in every single project I ever do. So I've included it here as well. So now we move this out of the way and take a look at what we actually have on the screen and we can start styling it up a little bit. The very first thing we're gonna do is come down and set the font family and font sizes and color all on the body. These will all inherit through so you can see that everything is set up as at least a decent starting point. Now when we're on small screens we sort of want the design to take up the entire viewport but when we're on larger screen sizes we do want it to be centered. So to be able to accomplish that what we can do is in a media query we can use the min height 100 bh display grid and place item center so it will center things at larger screen sizes. Now maybe everything would work well outside and you know doing it here without the media query but this is the breakpoint I'm going to be using for this project so that's because that's when the layout's changing and I want to ensure at that point it's centered I'm including it in the media query. And before we get into the layout one of the things I like to do is set up any of the generic or very simple styles. So the first thing we can start with is those section titles and for those we don't need anything too complicated we can just come in and set them up and once again if we take a look at them the colors of them are different but as I said on this section I'm going to be changing the color of the text on it and we can rely on inheritance to change that as we'll see in a second. Next up we can also style our button and give it the hover and the hover state once again is just coming from the designer who supplied there it is we have the regular and then we have that hover state there so now I have that hover that is coming on there as well. All we're doing is setting up some basic styles here, nothing too fancy. And I'm using a border radius of 100 VW because that just is a gigantic number. It ensures that we get this pill shape. Uh, it could be a much smaller number, but this works perfectly fine and I don't have to guess at it. And then I'm just changing the color on hover. Because it is a gradient background from a color to a gradient, uh, we can't do an animation on that. If you did want to do something like that, you'd have to actually have a gradient on both of them that moves and it gets a little bit more complex. So we're not doing anything too fancy. We're just going to go with a simple transition or lack of a transition, a simple switch like we have right now. Now, if we take a look here, we called this entire element my results summary. So we can get around to styling that, even though we will have a few other utility class style things coming in. But one thing we'll do is we'll give it a max width and we're gonna give this a display of grid. And the reason I wanna give it a display of grid is so at larger screen sizes, we can have two columns. So to be able to get two columns, it's nice and easy. We can do a result summary, grid template columns, one FR, one FR inside of our media query. And the reason that I'm using grid here instead of Flexbox is personal choice. If you'd rather use Flexbox, you can use that as well, though you'd have to select the two children to assign a flex basis to them or a flex of one just to ensure that they have the same size. Now, looking over here, when we're on the small screen sizes, we don't actually have that border radius with the box shadow on it. But here, when we're at the large screen sizes, we do. So that means that we can include some of those styles in this media query as well. So here I've added the border radius of 2 rem as well as this box shadow and you'll notice here I am using the HSL with the variable inside of it. The reason I'm doing that is if we simply went with the variable here and didn't use the HSL version but we just used the solid, you can see how dark that is because we're using the colors way too dark. We need to lower the opacity on that. So that's one of the reasons why I like doing it this way, where I have access to the HSL version of it. So I just have the HSL values getting passed in and then I can control the opacity of that shadow and make it lighter or darker and play around with that without any issues. So there we go. That's one of the use cases of putting the HSL here and we'll see a few more of them coming along as we go. Now next up we have the results that's right here so we can set that up and give it the background color and when we're looking at the design you can see that everything in here is text align center. Since everything is text align center we might as well rely on inheritance there. And this is once again another use case where we want to rely on that for the color as well, where we want to be using our HSL variable to be able to set the color once again so we can control the opacity of the text. So here I've set that up, but we haven't put the alpha value and you can see it's very, very light, whereas here we need to fade things out so that becomes very easy to do. We just come down, add our comma, and then we can do something like 8.5 or maybe 8.7 in this case to get the color that we're after. Now, one issue that we've run into is we have a border radius that isn't being adhered to on these sides. One simple solution for that is on the element itself that has the border radius, we can also put in an overflow of hidden. And by doing that, it means those parts that were overflowing get the border radius, but we don't actually get them over on this side. 
And ideally, this element is sharing the same border radius as its parent. There's a nice easy way to do that. We can do a locally scoped custom property. So on the result summary here, I find it easier to do it up here. And so on the parent, we can set the border radius. And then when we're using it, we can set the variable down there. And then we can also reuse that same variable over here on our results. And now we have that on here as well as on the parent. Now we could get rid of that overflow of hidden, though it's not getting in the way or causing any problems right now. After being interrupted by my dog barking and then my kids getting home, I didn't have any more time to finish recording. So you can see change wardrobe, I've shaved. We're gonna be jumping right back into it. But before we do, I just wanna ask you a quick question. Uh, and that's about what do you think of this format of video where on these longer form ones, I usually type everything out and I'm just walking through my process. Here, it's a little bit more jumpy, a little bit faster paced where we're looking at the code and talking about what it does. I'd love to know what you think, whether you love it, you hate it, you don't care one way or the other. Leave a comment down below to let me know, to know if I should be doing more of these, less of these, or whatever it might be. And with that, let's jump back into finishing this layout. We just got our border radius set up. I realized we were missing a little bit on the left, but you weren't really missing anything, so it's all good. And we're ready to keep on going with this where we need to add some padding now. Now this actually presents an interesting scenario because we have the padding here that's on our white background, but then clearly we don't want that padding to actually be on the parent because this element needs it as well. And if we were to add padding to the parent, then we'd run into a few issues along the way. But we ideally want the padding to be equivalent on the two of them. So once again, we can use custom properties for that. And here we have our border radius and we can also come in and add some padding this way. So this is going to control the padding for the entire element, even though it's only the children that have the padding on it. So we can add our padding in this way on both the results and the summary, and we can see they both have equivalent padding on them now. The nice thing with this is if ever we want to change it and we want this padding to be five for some reason, we can switch it and they both will change at the same time. So it's a nice way to have one padding declaration that controls it everywhere that we need it. Now, if we open our dev tools and just shrink things down a little bit, uh, we could also go in responsive mode if we wanted to, but we can also see here that everything's working in the sense that it's stacking properly. But the issue is once again, with our border radius in the top corners where it's not looking so fantastic. Ideally, the mobile design would not have a border radius on the top. So we can fix that really Really easily by coming down and where we did our initial border radius declaration where I'm just going to copy this here and what we're going to do is we're going to say that it's actually zero zero and then our border radius two times for the bottom corners so it's giving us our border radius on the bottom two corners and nothing along the top and then what we'd want to do is within our media query switch that over so we add it on all the sides so then we can add this media query in it leaves everything alone here we're using the same breakpoint as we were before and we're adding in the border radius back to what the original declaration is so now we have the border radius coming in like that it's also a little bit awkward that it's touching the sides, especially with the shadow and that border radius there. So if we go back up to this uh, media query, and you could definitely combine all your media queries together. If you're worried about repeating code though, once you upload things onto the server, most servers these days automatically compress your CSS files and repeated code like this, it makes a very small impact on the total size. So if you'd rather keep everything together uh, in one media query for each component or something like that, there's no problem with that. But if you do wanna separate them out like this, so they're all grouped together with the selectors, you're probably not gonna run into any issues. But here within this one, what we could do is add in a small margin on the left and the right. And so I'm gonna do that with a margin inline, which is the inline axis, which most of the time, if you don't switch your writing mode to be a vertical language, will always be the left and the right. So it just gives us a little little bit of cushion when we're on smaller screens, but when we have more space, it won't have an impact. Now we want to dive back into here and set up things a little bit better because they're not looking perfect, but they're actually not that far off. We can see that our font color here is really good. We've already done that. We just need to space things out basically and get this set up along with that grate right there. Now, if you remember when we set this up, we used our grid flow class in two different spaces and we're going to be using that to create the grid itself and space things out. And then after that, we'll tackle setting up the circle for the element in the middle. For the basic setup of this, I am setting things up like this and the align content start is very important here. If if we use our grid inspector and we look at things we can see that they're actually laid out really well here but if I did not use that align content start grid wants to stretch and it will take up all the available space now this obviously doesn't create a very good flow class when the gap isn't actually what's creating our spacing so we can put that on and it fixes that problem it keeps everything grouped together at the start or the top of the element now we did have this data spacing large that we wanted to use in a couple of spots as well so for that the easiest way to do it is to use our data attribute selector and we can set things up just like this this is one scenario where I used to use custom properties a lot to set the gap to make them easy to rewrite, but I've stopped doing that 
because custom properties will inherit in. So if you had a large one like we have in this case on the outside and then a smaller one on the inside, the custom property inheriting from the parent could actually impact the child. This prevents that from happening. And so if we look at the parent grid, we can see we have the large gap that's on those now. And if we look at the one that's inside of that, we can see that the gap is smaller. So the small one is using the one rem, the large one here is setting things up with the two rem, which is exactly what we wanted. Next up, what we wanna do is focus on the circle right here, which is pretty simple. We just have a gradient that's set on here and we have to increase the font size there and that's about it. So let's get that set up. So here on the result score, we're gonna start with a width as well as a margin inline auto just to center it within the space that it has. We have the background gradient that it already created when we set up the custom properties earlier. And I'm also putting an aspect ratio of one on here to ensure that it's a perfect circle because without that we would get some really ugly oval shape. The one problem is we also need the text to be centered within that space and we could either do that with Flexbox or Grid. To me Grid is easier because it is less lines of code. So we can use a display grid, place content center, and we get the number right in the middle. Next up, we need to style the 76 that's here. So the first thing I'm doing is giving it a display block because it is a span, but we wanna make sure that it's on a separate line from the of 100. We wanna set the font size to be the nice big font size on there, a font weight, set a line height just to keep the spacing from being too big, and of course, set the color to white instead of that transparent white that we set that everything was just inheriting within this space. Really fast with the selector here, I did just use the the span, I mentioned this earlier, it makes it a lot easier than having to come up with a class name specifically for the current score or whatever you'd want to call that. If you prefer not to use any descendant selectors like this, of course you could give it a class instead, but for me this works perfectly fine. Next up we have the result rank that we can style up with just a color, font size, and font weight on there, and everything is good. And this is where one place people often run into issues where they go there's too much empty space underneath here, and they try and come up with solutions to fix that. Do not do that yet. Maybe you need to fix things in the long run, but this isn't a problem at the moment. The problem is because we have too much content on this side and everything is really spaced out, but this is not what the final layout on this side will be. These items have to go next to one another. It's gonna make the space a lot smaller there. And right now these are trying to stretch to match each other. So before you run off trying to get this thing to be perfect, get the layout for both sides to be correct and then see if there's any inconsistencies and things that you might have to fix. Because remember, all of these things live in relationship with one another. That's sort of how CSS works. We're relying on inheritance to set things like colors. We're also setting up a layout that's relying on the relationship it has with other things. Never forget about those relationships. We can't work on this in complete isolation. We have to remember that it's part of a bigger picture. Get the entire picture sort of in the right direction before you start worrying about things like the extra spacing that's just matching the height of its sibling. Now jumping back to the HTML quickly here, we have our grid, the entire thing set up with our grid flow and our data spacing large, which is giving us the spacing in between these. And right now there's also a little bit of extra space because we have some invisible SVGs that we're gonna be dealing with soon. Before we get to that though, we will be doing a few things on this summary item, and that's gonna set the stage for our SVGs while we're at it. So jumping back over to the CSS, we can move down and we can set things up very quickly here. And you'll notice I'm using a display of flex along with the justified content space between to separate them out side to side like that. Align items center just to make sure everything's lining up nicely, a little bit of padding and a border radius on there. We can't see those yet, but we will be adding background colors. So we can start things off by using a display of flex to set the two columns up like we'd mentioned with a justify content space between to space things out and the align item center to ensure that we are aligning things. It does not look align center now, again, because we have some invisible SVGs. Uh, we have a little bit of padding, a border radius, and for now I've used a filler background color just so we can see these things a little bit, and we'll be changing that shortly. Now just so we can see our SVGs, I'm going to add this in for now, where we're just selecting our SVG that's inside the summary item and setting the stroke to red. I'm using stroke because of all the elements that we had before, that was the stroke that we removed from them. And I said we were gonna set that with CSS, so this is the beginning stages of that. But obviously we need these two elements to go one next to each other, and right now they're not, they're going stacked like this. And if we jump back into the HTML, just to take a look inside this element now, we have those inside of what I called a flex group. If you had a different name for it, that's completely fine, but I'm gonna style that up next. Now in the CSS, I'm gonna scroll all the way back up to a higher section here because this is sort of where we're keeping more utility class style layout things rather than things that are specific for this component that we're building and having something like a flow class or a flex group 
all seem to be a little bit more reusable. They can plug and play them where we need them. So I group those higher up in my CSS. And in this case, we're gonna have our display flex on there, a line item center, a gap, and a flex wrap. Just in case they run out of room, it lets them wrap around. And there we go, we have the SVG icon plus the text right next to it. Now let's go get those colors set up. And the way we're gonna do that is we'll scroll down in our CSS back down to this section. And if we come and take a look, you might remember that we use this data item type attribute uh, on here. And we're going to be using those to style the colors and set them through custom properties. So we can have our summary item with our data item type accent one. And then we want to set the custom property for that. And if we look at the design here, it is our red color where we set all of those up as custom properties up higher. And so we're going to set the custom property of item color using the accent one color that we had. When I set these colors up, I only included the HSL values. I did not include like a finished version of it. And that's because I knew we were gonna be using a lot of transparency in them. If you'd wanna do that more similar to how we did this, where we're mapping HSL values into HSL functions here, we could do that as well. But for these purposes, I didn't really see a need to do it. So if we come down here and we have that set up, what we could do is actually change the background color on all of these. And in that case, we could set it up to use our item color. Now, because it was only the HSL values, we wanna use an HSL function. And then inside that HSL function, we can put the color that we want. And you can see the red is coming through as the background color. And then we can just add in the transparency that we need for it. And of course, we need this to work for our SVG icons as well. So for those on the stroke, we can use the exact same thing, but set those just as the solid color. And these ones have disappeared because we haven't declared the custom property for anything other than accent one, but we can see that it's working wonderfully there. Now, before we get those next three set up, the other thing that we do need to set up here is to also set up our titles to be using the color as well. And once again, we're using the exact same method. Plus I'm also using my font weight bold here to make the text bold. Next, we can just duplicate this. So we have all of them. And then here we can switch this to my accent two, take these ones, switch them to the accent three, take these ones, switch them to the accent four, hit save, and all of those colors are set up and it's working wonderfully. Now this is a wonderful use case for custom properties and the advantage of stripping the color out of the SVG and then adding it back in this way is if ever a designer came back and decided to change one of these values uh, or changes the color and we change this over to maybe a 150, the color will change and the icon and the background, they all change together by updating one single value. And it's really easy to do. Of course, it's way too bright now, but you get the idea of it's really easy to make changes to the colors and everything is impacted. We don't need a new asset to switch things out with the SVG or anything like that. Also notice the spacing between these is correct already. That's because we're using that same flow class that we're using before. And you're also gonna notice that, remember before I said things were stretching out and the spacing was really awkward and everything's sort of falling in line a little bit better now than what it was before now that we've fixed our layout on this side. Now one issue does seem to be that this element has a bit more padding in the design on the left and the right side on the sides here than the element does on this side. We're going to tackle that closer to the end. It's really easy to set up but for now let's just fix up the rest of this. There's not very much more to go. So this is very similar to when we set up the score on this side over here. We can set up the summary score itself. We can lighten things up a little bit changing the color on this as well as set up our font weight for the entire thing that all inherits in and everything in there is using it. And then the user score once again was in the span. So I can just change the color of that span to have that highlighted a little bit better and match our design. And with that, we can now go ahead and try and match the padding a little bit. As I said, the padding on the top is the same for both of them. And it looks like the padding on the bottom is the same. It's only the padding on the left and the right of this side here and nowhere else. And if you remember, we were using a custom property for that to be able to control things all together. And to me, that relationship would probably be maintained. So the simple solution for that, if we come back up to here where we set up our padding on everything uh, is to actually break these apart into two different selectors. The reason I did it like this at the beginning is it's probably close enough and we don't really have to worry about it, but I do want to cover this because it's a nice little trick that I use uh, quite often actually. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take this and copy that and just come down a little bit further where we'd set up our summary. We never actually selected it. So we're just going to move this down here. So we have that declaration all on its own. Then moving back up, we can then delete all of this. I'm just going to remove that, delete that because we won't need it anymore. And in here where we set things up, we can bring in our padding, but we want the padding on the top and the bottom to be different from the left and the right. So the easiest way to do that is to declare it two times. And then on the second one, which is our left and the right, we can wrap that in a calc. 
and then just give this a multiplication factor of 1.5. So we're increasing the padding on the left and the right a little bit compared to the padding on the top and the bottom. If ever we change that padding custom property, all of them will grow or shrink in relation. So it still has that connection that we had before, but now we're doing it where we're just increasing the one on the left and the right a little bit. And it seems by doing that, it does help us match the design a little bit more. Now we can open up our dev tools really fast, hit the little responsive mode. So we have it in there and we can just see when we hit our breakpoint that it collapses and looks a lot more like the design that we had for the responsive mode that we have here. The border radiuses are all well set up. Everything is looking pretty good. We're taking advantage of grid, which is automatically having these items stretch, including our button at the bottom. And overall, I'm pretty happy with the end result here. Now, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see me build out more projects, including where I'm coding things a little bit slower instead of this style of video, you might be interested in the ones that are in this playlist right here where that's exactly what I'm doing. And with that, I'd like to thank my enablers of awesome, Johnny, Michael, Ralph, Simon, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.